Chapter 6, God Begins to Judge the Church. To understand the final tribulation period, we have sought an objective biblical perspective of God's plan of salvation as it unfolded throughout the history of ancient national Israel and continues to unfold in the New Testament churches. This perspective is extremely important near the end of time. Greater sensitivity to God's program for churches is crucial for believers. God formed the New Testament congregations. They were brought into existence all over the world. As God formed the New Testament congregations, He expected them to become adulterous. The seeds of spiritual adultery were in these congregations, as the same seeds were in the congregation of national Israel. God expected them to go contrary to His will, and they did. That expectation is the same for the New Testament churches. God warned the Old Testament congregation, the nation of Israel, and He also warns the New Testament congregation of what will happen if the church becomes unfaithful. God declares He will remove His candlestick. He will vomit that church out. He will bring terrible things against it and destroy it, as He brought terrible things against the Old Testament congregation, national Israel. How these judgments against the New Testament churches are to be carried out, and what is to happen to these churches will be studied. To look at the churches and congregations in their historical perspective is not too difficult. There have been traumatic times when Christians were persecuted and churches were assaulted by heresy from within. In spite of this, the movement of the church to evangelize the world has persistently continued. The rider on the white horse, to use the analogy of Revelation 6, has continued to go forth conquering and to conquer. Biblical basis that God will judge the church. The conclusion that the time is descending upon us when the church is to cease to function as the instrument of God to evangelize the world and is to be judged requires a basis in biblical authority. Jesus promised he would build his church, and the gates of hell would not prevail against it, Matthew 16 18. Satan was defeated at the cross. He could not frustrate God's plan to evangelize the world. Therefore, how could anyone dare suggest anything other than a glorious future for the church, a future that will continue till the last day of this world's existence? Some verses clearly teach that God expects the church to become adulterous. It may be argued, that does not imply that the end of the church age is upon us, or, that does not prove that God will reject his corporate body which Jesus went to the cross to establish, or, some denominations are not as faithful to the Bible as they should be, but this has been the situation throughout the history of the church. In view of these arguments, great care must be exercised before drawing conclusions that there will be an end of the church age, that there will come a time when, as a judgment of God, virtually all churches will be overrun by false gospels and when no one else can be saved. This is precisely why God has given us the Bible. Under no circumstances do we trust sin-tainted minds. Personal speculations and philosophies have no value. The Bible is God's book. It is perfect in its presentation of truth. Things in the Bible may be disliked but obedience to God's word is required. Biblical passages that speak of God's past or future judgments are not exciting to read. It is a happier situation to focus one's eyes and mind on biblical declarations of God's love and grace and be content with whatever God's judgments are. They will be tempered by God's love, compassion, patience, and forgiveness. To some, this is a happier and more acceptable part of the gospel. All of the Bible is God's word. We cannot pick and choose what we like to study and forget the rest of the Bible. We cannot stick our heads in the sand like the proverbial ostrich and hope that the danger of God's judgments will go away. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. We must be ready, therefore, to carefully, prayerfully, and obediently examine and study everything in the Bible. If the Bible brings us to a conclusion which is unacceptable because it is negative, ominous, or because it is something we have never before been taught, we must ask God for His mercy and grace to accept it and react obediently. Is it right to look at the experiences of ancient Israel, Babylon, and Egypt as guidelines for the future of the Church? Repeated references to these ancient nations have been made in an attempt to understand the future of the New Testament churches. References to these nations cannot be accidental or incidental. God says that all scripture is inspired by God. This principle cannot be set aside. God wrote extensively of these ancient nations to instruct us in the will of God. The Bible also answers the question of how biblical information about these nations can instruct us today. God's judgments on Old Testament nations teach us what to expect. God recorded the experiences of Old Testament nations to serve as warnings to us today. In I Corinthians 10 1-11 God speaks of ancient Israel when they sojourned in the wilderness after they came out of Egypt to go to the land of Canaan. They were a people especially blessed by God as indicated by the language of I Corinthians 10 1-4.
Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant, how that all our fathers were under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. The blessings did not protect them from God's judgment, because the next verse says, But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Verse 6, explains why God instructs us in his dealings with ancient Israel. There we read, Now these things were our examples, to the intent we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. God emphasizes the point of verse 6 with specific examples of sins that ancient Israel committed, sins which brought God's judgments upon them. Verses 7 to 10 admonish us, Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. The historical account of these sins and God's judgments upon Israel is in Numbers 16 41-50, Numbers 21 5-9, and Numbers 25 1-9. To clarify God's purpose in writing about these events, he adds in verse 11 of I Corinthians 10, Now all these things happened unto them for ensamples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. God is declaring that his dealings with ancient national Israel anticipate how he will deal with the New Testament church. Jude 5 also warns New Testament congregations, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroy them that believe not. God again instructs us to look into the Old Testament to learn from his dealings with those ancient peoples. The import of Jude 5 is ominous. In that single sentence God informs us that he destroyed his own people. God is not speaking of a wicked, heathen nation like Babylon, Moab, or Egypt. He is speaking of the nation that is the apple of God's eye, the nation that God had set apart for himself. This warning should cause any congregation to tremble. God does not speak any more lovingly of New Testament congregations than he does of ancient Israel. Jesus, who is eternal God, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He reacted to the sin of his beloved ancient Israel by destroying them, and he will react the same way to sin in New Testament congregations. Further biblical evidence that New Testament congregations are warned by God's actions in regard to his ancient people is in Hebrews 3 8-9, Harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. He warns us not to harden our hearts like they did, like the people of ancient Israel did when they were in the wilderness. He says in verses 15 to 17, Today if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he? Grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? God is again directing our attention to what happened to ancient Israel. This must be understood if one is to understand what to expect for the New Testament congregation. It has been seen that there was an expectation in the Bible of shattering unfaithfulness in the Old Testament congregation, national Israel, and there is an expectation that New Testament congregations will be shattered. It must be concluded that there is to be judgment on New Testament congregations as judgment came upon the Old Testament congregation. Old Testament Israel, not a perfect picture of the New Testament church The concept of national Israel as a picture of the New Testament church is limited. It is not a perfect picture. The reason is that the era of national Israel was followed by the era of the New Testament church, while the era of the New Testament church, congregations from Pentecost to the present, will be followed by the end of the world and judgment day. This sequence makes a difference. The difference is that grace would shine through the worst condemnations of national Israel of the Old Testament. One of many Old Testament examples is Ezekiel 20. In this chapter God speaks of his wrath which is to come upon ancient Israel. It is to be destroyed by the Babylonians. However, in verses 41-44a he says, I will accept you with your sweet savor, when I bring you out from the people, and gather you out of the countries wherein ye have been scattered, and I will be sanctified in you before the heathen. And ye shall know that I am the Lord, when I shall bring you into the land of Israel, into the country for the which I lifted up mine hand to give it to your fathers. And there shall ye remember your ways, and all your doings, wherein ye have been defiled, and ye shall loathe yourselves in your own sight, 
for all your evils that ye have committed. And ye shall know that I am the Lord, when I have wrought with you for my name's sake. God is emphasizing that grace will come. Beautiful things are going to happen to Israel in the future. The fulfillment of these promises is the Lord Jesus Christ, who is of national Israel, of the tribe of Judah. He is the head of a new nation of Israel, the Israel of God, which is made up of congregations that come from every nation. In Hosea chapter 1 God says ugly things to national Israel. Israel is being taken captive by the Assyrians, and God says in verse 2 of chapter 2, She is not my wife, neither am I her husband. Let her therefore put away her whoredoms out of her sight, and her adulteries from between her breasts. God goes on to say many ominous things because his wrath is upon national Israel. However, chapter 2 verses 14 to 19 have some of the most loving and most beautiful language of the Bible. God says, Therefore, behold, I will allure her, and bring her into the wilderness, and speak comfortably unto her. And I will give her her vineyards from hence, and the valley of Achor for a door of hope, and she shall sing there, as in the days of her youth, and as in the days when she came up out of the land of Egypt. And it shall be at that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishi, and shalt call me no more Bali, Ishi means husband, Bali means Lord. For I will take away the names of Balaam out of her mouth, and they shall no more be remembered by their name. And in that day will I make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, and with the fowls of heaven, and with the creeping things of the ground, and I will break the bow, and the sword, and the battle out of the earth, and will make them to lie down safely. And I will betroth thee unto me forever, yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness, and in judgment, and in loving kindness, and in mercies. God has in view here the only bride that Christ is married to forever, the body of believers that has come into existence all through time. It is for the most part believers that have come into the congregations, into a saving relationship with Christ, during the New Testament period. This softens Old Testament statements about the wrath of God and the utter destruction of national Israel, grace is going to shine through. When, as the Bible warns, the final destruction of New Testament congregations, which corporately represent the Israel of God, comes, then there can be no future blessings on the congregations. Old Testament Israel had a promise of future blessing. In this respect, it is not a perfect type of the New Testament Church. There is a parallel between a future blessing of Old Testament Israel and the New Testament Church. When God's judgment is poured out on the congregations, true believers will have a beautiful future. They will receive their resurrected bodies, they will receive the new heavens and the new earth. This is somewhat of a parallel between the blossoming of the Gospel and the end of the era of ancient Israel. God's judgment on the New Testament Church will parallel His judgment on the Old Testament Church In God's judgments there is a closer parallel. God's judgments on ancient Israel because of their sins parallel the judgments that will fall on the end-time New Testament congregations because of apostasy. God expected apostasy to cause the destruction of ancient Israel. The Bible also indicates that God expects the New Testament churches to fall away, and it warns that they, too, will be destroyed. The nature of Israel's sins will be compared with the sins that plague the congregations of today. We will study in greater detail how God responded to Israel's sins and thus understand what our congregations can expect. Ancient Israel's Sins A host of verses refer to Israel's sins, but just a few verses are needed to give an idea of what was going on. Equally explicit accounts of their sins are recorded in Deuteronomy, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, and other Old Testament passages and some New Testament passages. Jeremiah will be studied because Jeremiah was being written while the Babylonians were beginning to destroy Israel. It was the end of national Israel as a free and independent nation. It was a time of severe judgment on national Israel. This judgment typifies the judgment that is going to come against the congregations of the New Testament. Jeremiah 5, verses 30 and 31. A wonderful and horrible thing is committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests bear rule by their means, and my people love to have it so and what will ye do in the end thereof? This is a terrible indictment of the spiritual rulers. The prophets and the priests were commissioned and mandated by God to bring the truth of God's word to the congregation. They taught and preached in the name of Jehovah God, therefore, they should have been sure they were not bringing their own ideas or philosophies. They should have repeatedly checked their messages against the written word which they had in their day. They did not check, they taught their own doctrines. They brought messages that suited their fancy and pleased the congregation. The phrase my people love to have it so, indicts them for preaching lies and bearing false witness. They ruled according to their own pleasure rather than in accordance with the will of God. And what will ye do in the end thereof?
is a rhetorical question that indicates that they and the congregation will come into judgment for their conduct. There will be hell to pay for such rebellion against God. In Jeremiah 6 14-16 God takes the prophets to task over the Old Testament congregation. He warns, They have healed also the hurt of the daughters of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush, therefore they shall fall among them that fall. At the time that I visit them they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk therein. The indictment against national Israel is that the prophets were saying something like, Everything is well. God is not going to bring judgment against national Israel. We are God's people. We are God's congregation. We are the chosen ones. We will never come under terrible judgment from God. Jeremiah, you speak falsely when you say that the Babylonians are going to destroy us. There is peace in our day. Jeremiah 6 speaks about walking in the old ways or in the old paths. The old paths have to do with the scriptures. This is where truth is found. Ancient Israel was not satisfied with the gospel that the prophets offered from the scriptures. They wanted a more contemporary gospel. They wanted a gospel that dealt with the issues of the day and recognized that the Assyrians and Babylonians also had wonderful altars and prophets and worship services, and they wanted Israel to learn from them. In Jeremiah 7 8 God accuses Israel, Behold, ye trust in lying words, that cannot profit. All Old Testament prophets did not speak what God had given them. Some prophets spoke of ideas that came out of their own hearts, they said what they thought would please the congregation. They were lies because God had not said so. Jeremiah 16, verses 10-11, And it shall come to pass, when thou shalt show this people all these words, and they shall say unto thee, Wherefore hath the Lord pronounced all this great evil against us? Or what is our iniquity? Or what is our sin that we have committed against the Lord our God? Then shalt thou say unto them, Because your fathers have forsaken me, saith the Lord, and have walked after other gods, and have served them, and have worshipped them, and have forsaken me, and have not kept my law. The prophets began to bring their lies. The prophets began to neglect the truth that God had put in the old paths from the beginning, when he spoke through Moses and Abraham. The prophets began to speak from their own minds, and sin followed sin until ancient Israel worshipped other gods. God speaks plainly about the sin of ancient Israel and the indictments he brings against them. History is repeating itself in that the same sins are in the congregations of our day. The Bible discloses God's response to Israel's sin. This will be discussed in the next chapter. Chapter 7, God's response to Israel's sin God has dealt with the human race through his church. God expected ancient Israel to become apostate and as a consequence God's wrath would come upon them. The New Testament congregations, in the various denominations, are also to fall away. The Bible says that they, too, will become apostate. In the history of the New Testament church many congregations and many denominations that once flourished, have ceased to exist as congregations of the Lord Jesus. If they do exist they have become so apostate that they have another gospel, and can no longer be called a congregation of Jesus Christ. Comparing scripture with scripture reveals that Old Testament Israel is a picture, figure, type, or representation of the New Testament church. How God dealt with Old Testament Israel gives insights as to what can be expected for New Testament congregations. Christians ought to be part of New Testament congregations, and thus, should be intensely interested in what Christ did with the Old Testament congregation, Israel. Within our congregations the same seeds of apostasy exist. Many things go on in our congregations that match the sins that were prevalent in the congregation of Israel when God brought it into judgment. A few passages have given an idea of the nature of the sin of national Israel, sin that brought them under the judgment of God. If one desires to know more about the sin of ancient Israel, carefully read Jeremiah, Lamentations, Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Hosea. These passages tell a lot about the sin of ancient Israel. It becomes apparent that Israel's sin parallels what is happening in many congregations today. God's action in response to the sin of ancient Israel will be discussed next. God blinds Israel. The Bible reveals that a number of things happen to Israel. First, God begins to blind them, Isaiah 6. This judgment was declared almost 800 years before the end of the era of the nation of Israel as the external representation of the kingdom of God. Isaiah prophesied about 750 BC, almost 800 years before the cross, when the era of the congregation of Israel would end. Already in Isaiah's day, 
Israel had gone deeply into sin. Isaiah 6:10 tells of this indictment, Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert, and be healed. This is dreadful. God is speaking of His people Israel. They have rebelled against God, they have gone their own way. God gets involved and actually begins to blind them, which is what God calls for in Isaiah 6. Romans 11, verse 8 is a commentary on this. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear, unto this day. This indictment is brought against Israel because of their sins, God begins to blind them. It is bad that they were already blinded in their sin and in the perverseness of their hearts. It is bad that they were blinded by Satan who rules over the hearts of unsaved men. When God began to deal with Israel, He declared that He would blind them. This is emphasized in Isaiah 29 10-12. For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep, and hath closed your eyes, the prophets and your rulers, the seers hath He covered. And the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee, and he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed, and the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee, and he saith, I am not learned. God says here that he blinds the rulers of the church when the church begins to rebel against him. As it becomes increasingly wicked and rewrites the rules, God begins to blind the spiritual rulers and they can no longer see the truth. God removes the truth. Another of God's actions in response to the sin of ancient Israel was that he removed the truth. He took the truth away from them. This is implied in that he blinded the rulers. Almost 800 years before the end of the era of the nation of Israel, Isaiah chapter 3 verses 1 5 a were written, For, behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, doth take away from Jerusalem, and from Judah, the stay and the staff, the whole stay of bread, and the whole stay of water, the mighty man, and the man of war, the judge, and the prophet, and the prudent, and the ancient, the captain of fifty, and the honorable man, and the counselor, and the cunning artificer, and the eloquent order, and I will give children to be their princes, and babes shall rule over them, and the people shall be oppressed, every one by another. God here is taking away the stay and the staff. The staff has to do with the bread of life, the gospel. When God takes away the staff, the gospel is no longer available. It is not available because God has blinded the prophets. They are no longer able to bring truth. This is the judgment that comes upon the church as it becomes contrary to the word of God. The breaking of the staff is seen also in Ezekiel 4 where God tells about his judgment on ancient Israel. It was to be destroyed by the Babylonians. God indicates in verse 17 of Ezekiel 4, that they may want bread and water, and be astonished one with another, and consume away for their iniquity. This verse was previously examined in view of the third horseman of Revelation 6. It relates to the fact that the gospel was no longer available. God had removed the truth. It teaches the same sad truth as Isaiah 6. God rejects Israel. God blinded the people of Israel, removed the truth from them, and he rejected them. A number of verses speak of this, but one in particular is Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. The people of God, the congregation of Israel, were married to God in the Old Testament, but they were not listening to the Word of God. They did not want to be obedient to the Word of God. They wanted what was in their own minds. They wanted their own kind of gospel. To be rejected of God is terrible. The nation of Israel had been the apple of God's eye. God had carefully nurtured the congregation while He miraculously brought them out of bondage in Egypt, through the Red Sea, across the Jordan River, and delivered them into the land of Canaan. He defeated nations and conquered cities on their behalf. He gave them principles whereby they could know the way of God and know God. They rebelled against Him, therefore, God blinded them. He took the truth away from them, and now He rejects them. They are no longer His congregation. Earlier in the study it was seen that this rejection is stated in the language, He divorced them. The divorce became final in AD 33 when Christ hung on the cross. God's reaction to sin in the congregations is dynamic. God destroys the congregation. Another result of Israel's sin is that God brought judgments upon them. The judgments were of such nature that Israel was destroyed. The end result of a rebellious congregation is that God destroys it. In the case of the nation of Israel the destruction came by wicked nations that were under the power of Satan. 
God warned Israel that if they disobeyed him they would be destroyed by heathen nations. God warned the congregation of Israel before they came into the promised land, the land of Canaan, in Deuteronomy 28:47. Because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart, for the abundance of all things. In language of today, God is effectively saying, you are not content with the principles I have laid down for you. You want your own salvation program. God, therefore, declared in verse 49, The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. It was a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand that was to destroy them. The following verses of Deuteronomy 28 describe how that nation was to destroy Israel. Isaiah 28 presents the same truth, where God speaks particularly about the end of the 10 tribes of the northern kingdom which were separated from Judah upon the death of Solomon. God declares in Isaiah 28:7, approximately 722 BC, that he is going to destroy Israel because of their sins, but they also have erred through wine and through strong drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink, they are swallowed up of wine, they are out of the way through strong drink, they are in vision, they stumble in judgment. God uses wine and strong drink in this context to speak of running adulterously after other gospels. Earlier in Isaiah 28 he says, "Woe to the drunkards of Ephraim. First one, the prophets drunkenly run after gospels or religions of nations whose language they do not understand. God declares in verse 11 of Isaiah 28, for with stammering lips and another tongue, will he speak to this people. He concludes in verse 13 that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. This echoes the warning of Deuteronomy 28 that God would bring judgment upon Israel by a wicked nation whose language they did not understand. As will be seen, Assyria was the wicked nation that destroyed the 10 tribes of Israel and the capital in Samaria. The nation of Judah, 135 years later, 587 BC, the part of Israel that had its capital in Jerusalem, came into judgment because of its sins. God says in Jeremiah 5:15-17a, "Lo, I will bring a nation upon you from far, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. It is a mighty nation, it is an ancient nation, a nation whose language thou knowest not, neither understandest what they say. Their quiver is as an open sepulcher. They are all mighty men, and they shall eat up thine harvest and thy bread." Destruction again was upon Jerusalem and Judah by a nation whose language they did not understand. This is the language God used to declare he would destroy the congregation of Israel because of wickedness. How Israel and Judah related to the wicked nations that destroyed them will be examined in the next chapter.